In a world growing ever more politically correct, I want to assess some of the issues that I notice in Jordan Peterson's views of religion. Him and Sam Harris had a debate slash conversation. We're going to be assessing part one. Jordan is well known for being a bright thinker and always thinking of some psychologizing way of explaining religion and the phenomenon of belief, as well as speaks on political issues all the time. I'll do my best to avoid the politics and focus on religion because I do see something happening in his own psychology as we approach the topic of religion. As I said up front, we're not here to be politically correct. I want to bring the facts up to you so you understand where I'm coming from. My endeavor on this channel is to interview academics from all walks of life, but to get down to the data within these holy books. Sam and Jordan hit it off in this discussion, and Sam emphasized that they have a 10% disagreement at the end of the day on their views. I had so much admiration for him in those conversations. 90% of what he said in those conversations struck me as really wise and useful and well-intentioned. And 10% didn't. Sam was inspired by some of the podcasts that were done by Jordan Peterson on Joe Rogan and other shows. So up front, Jordan brings common ground to the table. Where they agree morally, ethically speaking, Sam Harris is a moral realist. But where things get tricky is when religion hits the scene in this discussion. They both recognize dogma coming in from both the secular and the religious world. And what are those commonalities between both the secular and the religious world? Sam Harris, at the end of the day, say dogma. And I think Jordan agrees, but also Jordan brings up the fact that primates in their bare nature fight against outgroups and they have a tribalism that's built inside where they will rip another tribe apart if they come in their territory. I like this approach because it allows us to try and understand the phenomena of humans and being we evolved from primates and are a modern primate itself, it's important that we keep this in mind as we understand whether secular or religious, why people are running with these dogmas. I imagine dogma is innate, but have we evolved to a point where we should be casting off these dogmas and does religion correlate to these dogmas? It appears Sam Harris does think that religion plays a significant role. The only reason why I would focus on religion in particular there is that religion is the only language game wherein fundamentalism and, and dogmatism, it, where dogmatism is not a pejorative concept. Dogma is a good word, in, in, specifically within Catholicism. And the notion that you must believe things on faith, that is in the absence of compelling evidence that would otherwise cause a rational person to believe it, that in a religious context is considered a feature, not a bug. Elsewhere, we recognize it to be a bug. And the other way to say that is the only thing that's wrong with religion is the dogmatism. And where Jordan and Sam hit heads or clash is where they talk about the interpretation of religion itself. Sam Harris brings up Islam as an example often in this talk, because there are extremes within the Islamic world that you don't quite see with Judaism or Christianity. And the problem is this, most people who are adamant believers of the faith of Islam are going to take this at face value when they believe in the teachings of their holy book. In light of many terrorist attacks that have occurred in history and in recent history, by those who are radicals within the Islamic faith, you can understand why someone like Sam Harris wants to hit the nail on the head with this issue. He points out that in the Quran, there are some extreme examples of hate and tribalism against other groups of non-believers. I mean, the very term itself, Islam, means submission. And in many places in the surahs of the Quran, you can find examples of hate. And I understand that there are those who are in the faith who would redefine this or make this mean only in self-defense moments. However, not all Muslims understand it this way. 
And in fact, that's something that Sam and Jordan talk about. Sam points out that the Quran can't be questioned. In fact, it's even deeper than a typical person would see the Bible. Take Islam as a specific, a specific example. Islam, mainstream Islam, not just Al-Qaeda style Islam, just any Islam that really is worthy of the name in the year 2021, is founded on the claim that the Quran is the literal word of God. It, it, and it is it is yeah, not the to question be is what what does literal mean yeah but the, but it, in the minds of most muslims most of the time it means that these stanzas were dictated to muhammad in his cave by the archangel gabriel and he was he was commanded to recite and he recited them and what we have here in, in truth the claim the orthodox claim is is even more stringent than the seemingly analogous you know fundamentalist religion uh, you know christian claim about the bible it is this book and every jot and tittle of it is perfect and cannot be redefined or edited or changed in any way and the understanding of that book is what Jordan tries to emphasize. Whoa, 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 whoa. Well, what if the text is true, but the believers who say that they understand it, their understanding is flawed. This gets into the psychology of Jordan, where Jordan, I feel, is being an apologist for these holy books. In many ways, Jordan has an interpretation that I, as I've been studying this for a long time with real academics who are experts in this field, don't draw these interpretations. And when they do, it's kind of odd. Like John Dominic Crossan, when he interprets Jesus through this social reformer perspective, and if Jesus was an apocalyptic prophet, he might've got the timing wrong, but was his message wrong? See, Dale Allison Jr., He's pointed out in our Jesus course that we have coming up, the quest for the historical Jesus, that John Dominic Crossan will interpret biblical narratives and Jesus through the lens of his Irish and Ireland politics, the issues he grew up with in his own experience. Is Jordan doing something the same? It sounds and looks like this is what's happening. See, Jordan seems to be influenced by people like Joseph Campbell, the hero with a thousand faces and the way that he interprets the biblical stories through that lens is quite illuminating. Man, do I wish the world interpreted these stories the way that Jordan is interpreting them. However, that isn't the case. And is Jordan just this lonely voice out there trying to understand the biblical story in a way that 99.9% .9 of its adherents don't follow or interpret it that way. Let me give you an example from the Quran. Surah 3, 151. We shall cast terror into the hearts of those who disbelieve, all non-Muslims. Surah 9, 5. Then kill the disbelievers, non-Muslims. Wherever you find them, capture them and besiege them and lie in wait for them in each and every ambush. Now, a fundamentalist who might be reading this text, who can't edit this, can't reinterpret this, might be reading this and saying, I need to take this to heart. And in fact, we've seen this happen with extremist groups within Islam. And so the fundamentalist claim is far worse. It's that not only is there an absolute reality, truth embedded in the book, yeah. but that their particular take on that absolute reality is the absolute take on that book. Yeah. And so they conflate their own they, they, they make an assumption of their own omniscience and then pass that off onto God, so yeah, to speak. except in their defense, and I don't often rise to the defense of fundamentalists. <laughs> no. it's, it's very easy to get there because some of the, the claims in the book are not at all hard to parse. In fact, so many of them can only be honestly interpreted one way. So to take, uh, again, an example that will be not inflammatory, uh, to you, but uh, makes the point. It just says that the, the remedy for theft in the Quran is to cut the, the hands off a thief. I mean, you, 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 that, that is the unambiguous injunction. It's not an allegory. Mm -hmm. It's not. It's, so, so the you have to you have to in, right. indulge some kind of tortured uh, interpretive scheme to avoid the 
the, the shocking fact that the creator of the universe w thinks you should live this way for, for all time. Now, I am in no way saying all Muslims think this or believe this way, but there is an inherent issue in the way that they're approaching the text. How do we reinterpret all of these texts? It can be done, and many of them do. It's purely in defense, self-defense only. This is where this happens. When the disbeliever attacks us, historically, I've asked this of Robert G. Hoyland and other experts in Islamic studies, that actually there was an offensive, an aggression on behalf of the Muslims early on in history. And of course, sure, there were times of defense as well. But there wasn't always a time of defense, even in the times of Muhammad himself. So when a believer who's following the perfect example for all space and time and existence is setting a course on how one should behave, and he is that set example, no wonder many extremists follow in his footsteps and reading the Quran do what the Quran is saying at face value. It'd be amazing if Jordan Peterson's interpretations of biblical stories, as well as the Quran, were impacting the world in such a manner that everybody saw this as some internal struggle and psychoanalysis of one's own behavior and the world around them with tyranny and such. But that's not what is being understood and applied on a daily basis. So why does Jordan do this? Jordan, I believe, actually applies this to his own life and psychoanalyzes everything. I couldn't help but think, and I know this is going to sound bad, but if there is a, a pile of chicken shit, he would find a way to make chicken salad. And this is the problem I saw within the conversation between Sam Harris and Jordan Peterson. Sam goes, we could do anything. We can interpret anything this way. Are there important psychological truths to be found in the rubble? Yeah. In this case, Jesus is going to come back and throw the sinners into a lake of fire. And I've, yeah, see, a, I read, I've read to the end of the book. It's pretty scary at the end as well. I mean, Revelation is... Yeah, yeah, yeah. No kidding. So there's an idea that's expressed in that book is that it's something like things are always falling apart in a fundamental manner. It's part, it's built into the... There's an apocalyptic element to human life. We fail in small ways and we fail in catastrophic ways. And everything that we have, we lose and we die. So there's, and, and societies come to an end. There's an apocalyptic element built into the structure of human reality. And part of, part of what's revealed in that strange book at the end, which is like a hallucinogenic nightmare in some sense, mm -hmm. is that the hero is born at the darkest point in the, in, the, in the journey. And it's a psychological truth and it's very, very apt. Because at the, at the darkest point, this is also why Christ is born near, near the darkest time of the year from a, from, a, from a metaphysical perspective. There's an idea there that when things fall apart, that's the time for the birth of the hero. And the hero in Revelation is also the, the place where, free, where, where truthful speech most clearly manifests itself. Because in the Christian tradition, Christ is identified with truthful speech. And so the notion there is that redemption under apocalyptic conditions is to be found in the revelation of truthful speech, which is something that you actually believe. Well, I, I believe in truthful speech, but I also believe that you can play this kind of interpretive game with almost any text. But this is this way of but thinking. But then you can do it with the world, Sam, and that, that wreaks havoc with your value from facts argument. It, no, no I, actually, I did, didn't hear what you just said. What was that? Well, I said you can, you, can, you can make exactly the same objection with the world of facts. Is there's an infinite number of facts, and there's an infinite number of potential interpretations. And so pa tracking the pathway from the fact to a value is actually impossible. And Jordan came off with honestly, to me, incoherent points to try and bring out. It sounds almost like while he's against moral relativism, the words he's saying are so relative that you can't make sense of them. You can reinterpret anything to mean anything with Jordan's methodology and how he's approaching these ancient texts. The way he approaches the book of Revelation, the way he understands this as the hero who comes at the darkest hour, that Jesus being born in the winter solstice, the darkest time of the year is when the hero comes and he comes to bring light and salvation to the world that's full of darkness beautiful, wonderful interpretation. And in fact, there may be some validity in having Jesus being born in December the 25th in this kind of model. However, most Christians do not interpret it this way. 
See, I've interviewed a scholar, Reuven Firestone, who's a Jew. He's a Jewish scholar, and he understands the war literature of the Hebrew Bible. And he expresses that, yes, these people were at war with surrounding neighbors. We see this issue with the Canaanites and other people in the biblical narrative. In fact, God so much says, kill every man, woman, and child in some instances with King Saul. King Saul is stripped of his kinglyhood or being king of Israel because he doesn't do that command that God gave him. Now, many apologists will back off or reinterpret, and many Christians or Jews do not follow and practice what their texts say here as far as owning slaves or the treatment of women and such. But there is some of this in some places of the world. In fact, when I went over to Israel, Jerusalem, Palestine, if you will, and saw them at the Welling Wall, saw that there was a side where men are allowed to pray and they have all sorts of room, much larger side. There's a small section on the right side of this wall where the women get And when their children are turning 13 and they have their bar mitzvah, the women have to remain on that side and look and watch their kids while hanging out over the fence, viewing them with their fathers celebrating the bar mitzvah. But they have to be separate because that's how they have the rule there. In fact, conservative Orthodox Jews, I guarantee you enforce that kind of rule that is in that area. My point is, patriarchy, misogyny, all of these kind of ideas, slavery, you name it, are still inherent and are even promoted within the biblical text. See Joshua Bowen and Dr. Kip Davis's debate that's going to be coming on Myth Vision at some point, but he's also written books about this very issue. Now, will the Muslims come along and reinterpret or find a way to neglect practicing archaic things that are within their tradition? I think many have, and I hope many more do. But when your text has it built into the text and the understanding that most people in the religious world hold to is a dogma which promotes these violent or horrific archaic ideas, what are we going to do? Try and defend these religions and act like their initial interpretation was some internal struggle of psychology that each human has to struggle with? I don't think we should be making chicken salad out of chicken shit. I think we should just choose a whole different platform or a whole different point of language in which we are trying to understand how to better act in the world we live in. See, that's not how most people believe it. And I hope that more people will see this and recognize even the dodginess that Jordan Peterson takes when it comes to these kind of things. He loves to attack people who are politically correct. But at the same time, when it comes to religion, he himself is taking a politically correct position and not being consistent when it comes to these issues. Jordan highlights the fact that primates act in these atrocities, regardless of being secular or religious, and that humans carry these characteristics, which therefore he thinks go deeper than religion itself. And I actually agree with this assumption here that humans are obviously evolved primates, and there is this inherent natural instinct to be tribalistic and to pick sides. In fact, I see politics as well as religion to go right into that avenue or that vein deeply. However, what Sam Harris points out that I want to emphasize and I think is very important is how religion, the dogma that comes with religion and how dogma is of course encouraged within it. That's why there is dogmatism within religion. But the dogma is actually in the vein, oftentimes archaic and going closer to that primate instinct. So there's times of war, times of killing those who aren't one of you or aren't part of your group. That's something that is still a carryover from our earlier evolutionary process. And if we can evolve out of that, why do we need these dogmas or religions to begin with? One more analysis is interpretation and the meaning of words that I find quite dodgy or strange with Jordan and Sam. Sam points out, as I've had academics on all the time, expressing the original languages and the cultural context and the meaning of these texts and what they meant to their original audiences. Jordan Peterson is definitely taking a 19th, 20th century 
almost Jungian interpretational model and projecting it back onto the biblical text, onto the Quran, or whatever holy book it may be, trying to find deeper meaning within the ink of these texts. But as Sam points out, it's not that simple. In fact, there are some texts that are so clear and obvious on what they mean face value that you're actually doing an injustice to the literature by trying to go and do this special psychologizing to this ancient literature. See, Jordan tries to defend that it is the believers who have misunderstood the text and that the text may not mean what they interpret it to mean. Therefore, they act like they have the omniscience of meaning on these texts. And while that's important to understand that how people perceive and interpret these texts can change over time, the real question is, sometimes the texts themselves are just so ugly and just so straightforward that in fact you look like you're doing double standards and special pleading just to try and pretend the text means something else to give it the benefit of the doubt rather than what the text actually means. And Sam Harris, I think, is right in his approach of this text. Sure, he wishes that we could all just get every human being on planet Earth to just reinterpret and psychologize these texts to make them mean something of your own inner struggle. And this inner struggle is something this journey as a human you're going through. However, the texts themselves, you're actually doing damage by reinterpreting them the way that Jordan is doing this, rather than seeing it the way they see it. And unless Jordan can change the whole world of believers and how they horrifically interpret and apply some of this literature in their own lives, I just don't see any point in why he would want to change it when academics are actually showing you their original intent and purpose here on Myth Vision.